Is it just counting down? Oh, you're on mute now. Good evening and welcome to the GovHack Digital Conference for 2024. I'm Chris Vella, the Regional Operations Lead for GovHack, and I'm excited for today's presentation. Strengthening Australia's Democracy, a Practical Agenda for Democratic Resilience. I'd like to start off by giving my thanks and acknowledgement to our sponsors who make it possible for GovHack to function. Our friends at Infosys are the corporate international sponsor for this year and have supported GovHack for many years. The Australian Government Department of Home Affairs are also a close working sponsor in particular for this event. I encourage you to engage with the session by using the Q&A feature to ask any questions. We have reserved time at the end of the presentation to answer these questions, so don't worry if we don't get to them immediately. Without further ado, I'm honoured to welcome Robin Ross and Kathleen Lafan from the Department of Home Affairs. I'll now hand over to allow them to introduce themselves and commence the presentation. Thank you, Chris. Let me just see if I can share my screen. Give me a thumbs up that that's working. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Chris. My name's Robin Ross. I'm from the Strengthening Democracy Task Force, and I have my colleague Kathleen Laffin here today, and we're going to be jointly presenting to you on um, some very exciting work that we've completed over the last 18 months. We're very excited to be a sponsor for the GovHack 2024. This is the first time that we've been involved um, and are very excited and hoping that people take up our challenge as the topic that they might work on over the weekend. So what we are going to do today is cover a little bit about the department, just so you understand a bit about home affairs. And then we'll spend some time talking about a report that we recently launched, um, which you can access online. So the Department of Home Affairs was created in 2017. It's gone through different iterations, bits and pieces have come in and out. It was essentially um, an amalgamation of immigration and border protection. And then also we added the AFP and ASIO, and I'm pretty sure at the beginning, the Emergency Management Australia was there in, as well. So it was all about the things you need to keep Australia safe and secure. And over time, things have changed slightly, et cetera but it's often in the media for all the wrong reasons. And that's because we deal with some really thorny issues. So the department is responsible for cyber and critical infrastructure resilience and security. So all of those cyber attacks that um, have been in the media over the last year, we've been involved in trying to manage the response. Um, we're responsible for immigration and citizenship services, as well as refugee and humanitarian services border security and management, and we do that with the assistance of our ABF operational arm. We manage counter-terrorism uh, and citizenship and social cohesion. And then there's us, the Strengthening Democracy Task Force. Um, but more on us a bit later. So uh, I've put the vision and the mission there so that you can understand what the department is responsible for. But essentially, it's uh, management and delivery of migration, humanitarian and refugee programs, and then other things such as countering foreign interference, um, cyber and counterterrorism services. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Robin, can you hear me? Yep. yep yeah, great. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, so just in terms of our ministers, I'll talk to that. So we've had a bit of a change as of the 28th of July, 2024. So there was a realignment of ministerial priorities and um, this has seen um, our, a new minister in place who is Tony Burke. And he also is uh, the Minister for Home Affairs, Minister for Immigration, Multicultural Affairs. And this removes, this 
moves the responsibilities for immigration citizenship and multicultural affairs from the outer ministry into cabinet. Uh, the expanse, this is an enormous organisation, and the expanse involving importance of these responsibilities has seen the appointment of the Honourable Matt Thwaite, MP, to the role of Assistant Minister for Immigration, and the Honourable Julian Hill to the Assistant Minister for Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. And we've had a new appointment, a Special Envoy for Social Inclusion, Mr Peter Khalil, which is a really interesting development that hasn't existed before. Thanks, Kath. Um, so now a little bit about uh, the Strengthening Democracy Task Force. We were obviously formed um, under the previous minister, Minister Claire O'Neill, and it was her pet baby. She was very worried about democracy and wanted um, a task force created to help government understand what sort of practical initiatives they could put in place to protect, nurture and strengthen um, Australia's democracy, sometimes also referred to as democratic resilience. So this was because um, around the world, democracies are being tested by all sorts of new and um, evolving vectors. So we've got rapid advances in technology. Think of AI. Think of how AI can be used on social media to um, amplify and um, amplify messages that are polarizing. We've got changing dynamics of income and wealth inequality. We've got climate change. There was the COVID-19 pandemic, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the ongoing Hamas-Israel conflict and its um, domestic consequences for social cohesion in Australia. And then we've got foreign interference and mis and disinformation. So we were established. So all these things are considered to be threats that um, have an impact on how democracy operates and people's perceptions of democracy and people's trust in democracy. Um, so we were established to try and identify practical initiatives that government could consider to help strengthen and combat these threats to democracy. So we come at it, so the task force's remit was to come at the issue from a strengths-based perspective. And we've been based in our national security um, group within Home Affairs, where all the other threats or the policy responsibility for all the other threats also reside so that we're informed by those um, to help us understand uh, how best to deal with them. Over to you, Kath. So as um, Rowan was saying, we have this environment where there's a lot of threat and we often refer to that as anti-democratising forces. So um, as Robin alluded to, there are a whole host of things that um, we see in both domestic and international environment that pose threats to democracy, but uh, we in the Strengthening Democracy Task Force, we're very focused on the positive attributes of Australian democracy. And so um, one of the, uh, in doing research, we looked at those things that they historically had given Australia's democracy strength. So we saw that one of the strengths of Australia was our trusted institutions. So this, this leads to us to talk about security, integrity, legitimacy, responsiveness and performance of the democratic institutions and Robin will talk to these a little bit later in a different way. We also see one of the major strengths of Australia is credible information. So that's when we're talking credible, we're talking the accuracy, relevance, responsibility, accessibility and civility of information flows within the deliberative public space. So um, I think some of you in the tech space will um, be familiar with some of those, the um, uh, credibility and accessibility frameworks, CIA, I think you call it. Um, so similar, we have um, that, that need for truth. And um, the third thing that we're really interested in is social inclusion. That's one of the things we've seen as a strength of Australia, uh, that it, we are connected, cohesive, participatory, engaged and respectful, reinforcing and reflecting a sense of common purpose and shared identity. And as I said, they're, they're the strengths that we've really focused on and, and the traditions that we'd like to reinforce and build upon. Over to you, Robin. Thank you. So this is what our report looks like. If you've got your phone, you can have a look at that QR code. Alternatively, you can find it on the Home Affairs website if you look up Strengthen Australia, Strengthening Australian Democracy. And there's a PDF version you can download. Okay. 
The report um, uh, sets out five different ideas around democracy and 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 you know um, consolidates the the research that we have undertaken over the last eighteen months. So idea one is that democracy is a national asset worth protecting. So democracy is quite embedded in people's way of life or the Australian way of life, but often not necessarily um, explained or recognised in that particular way. So um, as Kath was saying, there are three strengths in Australian democracy that we like to talk about. Each word begins with the letter I. So trusted institutions. So we... The AEC, the Australian Electoral Commission, is an example of a highly trusted organisation that delivers free and fair elections. Um, and Australians don't question the results of our elections. You know, they 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 take for um, for gospel the outcome of an election as overseen by the AEC. So that's what we mean by trusted institutions. We're unlikely to see the same sort of response that we saw in the US where Trump disputed the election result. We don't have that sort of response in Australia because of the strength of our, our institutions. We also have uh, credible information. Um, so the I there is information. So Australia has a free media. It strives to support independent journalism. And it, in, through this, we encourage um, a multitude of voices and views so that people can make their own decision based on a variety of inputs and information that's available to them to help them work out what their views on a particular topic might be. And without that independent journalism, you can imagine what steps in to fill the void. There's social media um, and TikTok where a lot of people get their information from. So Australia has a, a, a free media, which is really important and really critical to a thriving democracy. The third strength is social inclusion and Australian society can be typically um, um, explained through its vibrant multicultural inclusive society. And we also like to describe this as where civic participation and volunteering is welcome. So it's that in between, it's not government activities, it's not private sector activities, it's where people come together and um, collaborate and do things that are good for the community, become involved, um, and but it's also an opportunity where people can be, come together to voice their opinions to government on, you know, form a, form a collective, form a group and write to government to say, this is wrong with our, this is a thing that's wrong with our community or this is what we want to do to change society or our community. So it, it helps um, people participate and understand how democracy works, how to use those levers at their disposal to, um, to make changes that they see are important for their particular, um, you know, whatever their interests might be. So our democratic values are embedded within society and the way we operate. And it's also a national asset worth protecting. Over to you, Kath. Thanks. So idea number two, Australia can draw inspiration from our long tradition of strengthening democracy through ingenious means. So Australia has a long history of ingenious means. Um, and I think with the first few dot points talks about where Australia has been a pioneer. Um, so among the first for women to get the vote, compulsory voting. Uh, uh, th there is also a funny one that's not in there that we had our own uh, electoral ballot box that was shaped to go around a horse. So I always thought that was really interesting that, you know, it doesn't hit the academic rigour to uh, rank to be included here. But I think important to this story is the fact that um, we're not the first generation to face challenges and democracies are tested and our ability to face those tests are um, what I guess we see as Australia having that ability to um, be ingenious in the way we respond to things. Um, every generation discovered that our democratic, democratic values need to be nurtured and safeguarded. Um, so despite the challenges, it's also something we value. So we should treasure our democracy. Um, and example of this uh, democratic innovation and bribery is 
sorry, I'm tangling my words, our vibrant innovation and civic society is around us everywhere when we see crisis where people will become part of the recovery mission. So that's just an example. Um, as Robin was saying, there's volunteers and we get out and help each other in, in times of crisis. Okay, over to you, Robin. <laughs> Thanks, Kath. Um, this third idea is that Australia's democracy is strong, but it's vulnerable. So we had the pleasure of, um, Sorry, firstly, I'll just say that um, it's quite difficult to measure the state of democracy. Um, and that's because each country operates slightly differently and um, has different laws um, that make it just a little complicated to, to measure. But some of the international indices that exist that um, compare performance, de democratic performance across democracies, um, assess Australia's performance on democratic fundamentals, such as the fairness of our elections, the protection of rights, and you know Australia has some good protection of rights laws, the degree of civic participation, how, how frequently people participate in civic society, especially through volunteerism, and then some of the checks and balances on public officials and institutions um, that give confidence to the public that government is performing well and can be trusted. Um, so Australia actually does rank quite well on many of these indices, although um, we're not immune to some of the threats that we've seen other democracies face. So I like to give the example of the US and the current debate around democracy um, through their election process. Um, we've seen in South America, various um, challenges and tests to democracy there, as well as in Europe. Um, this year, we had the pleasure of working with the, um, actually it was last year, working with the um, Australian Public Service Commission and their Trust and Transparency Unit to design a survey that helped us understand people's views on democracy. And the report itself is called Trust and Satisfaction with Australian Democracy. It's up there on the slide. And you can also access that through the APSC website. Um, and it helped us understand what people's views were on democracy. Um, so generally speaking, the majority of Australians are highly value their democracy, think it's important, and they're quite satisfied with its performance. But only one or two think it is, um, one in two think it is on track, i.e., you know, we've phrased this that it's vulnerable. Um, their main concerns are that there is a sense of corruption. Um, so that's that 49% um, figure I've got up there. And that talks to the strength that we mentioned before, trusted institutions. So if people think that there's corruption in institutions, then it destroys the trust that they have and their faith in how it, the, uh, that particular institution is going to look after them and the services that it provides. 72% um, believe that most people don't understand when information in the media is misleading, okay? So there's a real concern that misinformation um, is freely available and people don't have the critical thinking skills um, to understand how to interpret, how to judge whether something is misleading or not. And that then attacks the second strength that um, Australia has in terms of its democracy, which is credible information. If we can't, if people can't understand what is credible, and what should be used to help inform their own opinions, then we've got a problem. And then 46% of Australians believe democracy is um, kept safe from foreign interference, but um, there is some concern that it does play a significant role in affecting communities and how they operate and how they vote. And so this goes, this, this has the, the, a destabilising impact on social commun on communities and therefore social inclusion, which of course is that third strength that we have um, that we've identified as within Australian democracy. But satisfaction within democracy is quite high among some groups. So it tended to be higher in men over women, tended to be higher with those who have higher incomes, tended to be higher in those who are employed over those who aren't employed. Those born outside of Australia, which is quite interesting. Um, so obviously uh, we've, we've had some discussions around this and we think it's often people coming to Australia's to Australia don't necessarily have a great experience of democracy from the country that they came to, but they feel that that um, what Australia can offer them is very satisfactory. Whereas those who've been here, who live here, um, may have a healthy cynicism of what Australian democracy is like. 
And then there is greater satisfaction with those who don't use public funded media over those who do, i.e. those who rely on public funded media sources, SBS and ABC, for their news and information tend to be sat more satisfied with democracy compared to those who don't use that sort of source for their information and news. But the good news is that Australians are overwhelmingly um, or overwhelmingly believe it is worth trying to fix the problems that democracy may have. And as we've mentioned before, we're not the first generation to uh, face challenges. We won't be the last, but we also come with it or bring with it or celebrate the fact that we're quite ingenious in how we um, attack, we tackle the threats and problems that democracy has ahead of it. Okay, so um, this is what we call the constellation of challenges that exist. And you can see the central part are our three um, areas of strength. And on the outer circle are all of those um, areas of anti-democratizing forces. So um, I guess one of the ways of approaching this is um, to think about um, certainly our practical agenda is to think about ways that we might strengthen democracy by addressing these indirectly. So we aren't proposing that we counter disinformation with uh, credible information. What we're saying, as uh, Robin's alluded to, is that we might look at increasing people's digital literacy or um, that we help them with critical thinking to understand that, um, you know, a lot of information they're getting online is fed by an algorithm or, you know, AI generated information. So the more we can build people's knowledge, the more we are um, building our capability, to resist those anti-democratizing forces. Um, and, you know, in effect, we can, um, as, as Robin was saying, you know, it has an impact on a, at even a social level of um, with intolerance and um, perception. So it's really important to our sense of self as a community and as a nation that uh, democracy, democracy um, speaks to these anti-democratizing forces. Um, sometimes linkages aren't overt, um, but uh, certainly I think as you'll see set out in this diagram, um, it's it's powerful, some of these forces that we don't have control over in, in the current day. So over to you, Robin. <laughs> Thanks, Kath. Um, so the last idea in the report talks about a strong democracy as a resilient democracy, and it outlines a series of practical approaches to democratic resilience and how they need to be a combination of activities that protect, engage and experiment with what else we can do to safeguard Australia's democratic resilience. So um, I've put some things up there on the screen. I won't read through them all, um, but you know, some of the ideas in the list um, are that we could fund support for journalism to ensure that it's a free and rigorous press for the accountability of both government, the private sector and social institutions. We could fund and roll out media literacy and critical thinking courses available for children through to the elderly, like um, many of the things we need to do are not just for children, not just for the elderly, but for the whole Australian um, society or, or, or um, population. Um, we should celebrate uh, memorialisation practices, such as the democracy sausage. It's something very simple, but people know exactly what you're talking about. And it's a fun and positive message about democracy and our ability to vote freely. Um, many of the things that are in here talk about civic engagement being the heart of many practical strategies for building democratic resilience. It's about how people take an active interest in public life. And it depends on the willingness and ability of citizens to participate in a shared democratic society. Um, amongst those, the sorts of things that could take place are things like citizens' assemblies, which involve citizens in key decision-making processes that, about issues that affect them, or deliberative town hall meetings where they get to have a say, or experiments that trial new methodologies to address common issues. Um, so chapter five is quite an interesting read, and there is a lot in chapter five, um, but I've just tried to skim over, you know, the basics there to help you understand some of the things that um, 
we haven't recommended, we've just sort of highlighted that these things exist. And a lot of the um, practical initiatives are not just Australia-based. It's the research that we've done across the world and different ideas from different countries and the sort of success that they have had. Um, so that brings us to our final slide. Again, we've got the QR code there. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that we can see the questions and see if you have anything you wish to ask of us. Excellent. Thank you, Robin and Kathleen, for presenting. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please put them in the Q&A feature. Um, I had two questions that I, I posted throughout the session, um, if, you've, if you'd like to take a look at those. Um, probably the one that I'm, I'm most interested in um, so these sorts of reports, it, it looks like a really good and comprehensive report. And I work in cybersecurity, so it's it's very relevant to me. Um, but they they tend to take months or years to create and longer to gain political traction. With the meteoric rise of things like AI and the creation of synthetic media and fake news, do you think these sorts of reports and its approach can sufficiently cover all of these emerging technologies and issues? No, no, that's a great question. I think there are many arms of government working on things like AI security and AI um, regulation to make sure that they can um, have um, as far reaching um, a lever as possible to manage these sorts of implications, especially for things like um, elections. You know, we're going to see a plethora of deep fakes in the US election and other sorts of AI generated um, activities, memes and information or, or the information is generated and the AI um, algorithm is used to spread it very, very quickly. So um, we're very aware of those sorts of things. This is just one report in, amongst many that government is aware of and knows the, the risks and is trying to use the strengths of each government department and their area of responsibility and remit to address. I just say, I think it's a little like teach a man to fish, this idea that we uh, try and increase critical thinking and awareness and uh, digital literacy, because if you teach people to understand a, a little about AI, we don't need to regulate as, you know, from our position where we sit, where I'm not speaking for whole of government, but certainly from home affairs perspective, we can actually build on strength rather than um, resist or try and fight something that is a losing battle. Um, but if people are attuned to um, misinformation or synthetic media, um, they can start picking it. It almost becomes like a game and um, it actually can lose a lot of power um, if it becomes humorous too. I think if people can take it in good humour or um, I think the, a good example of that was um, the photographs of Kate Middleton, you know, with their hands. Yeah. And there's a good example where, you know, you, a lot of people would have learnt a lot from that process of, you know, doctoring a photo. And um, yeah, so I think that's a, a useful um, example. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and my other question was was probably a bit, a bit deeper in, like, how does the task force envision balancing the need for protection of democratic institutions, in, institutions, sorry, with the importance of maintaining an open and transparent society? So obviously it's, you could just ban all of these things and that's that's one of the ways that some countries are approaching it. Um, how do you think we should approach it and, and manage that, that balance? I think um, I'll start by saying there's an implied freedom of speech in Australia. And we also uh, embrace the ability for people to protest peacefully. And so we are not uh, opposed to people finding a voice. Um, the same as for government, I will go down the track of the National Archives, as I always do, because I used to work there. And that's about giving access to government records on government decision making. So I think they're cornerstones of a democracy. They're important attributes that um, help us um, understand our democracy. I might pass to Robin. Uh, she'll obviously have some comments. So is your question more about the protection of open society or is it about public institutions, trust in public institutions? It, it's more about balancing that, um, like, people's freedom of speech, kind of as, as mentioned, versus yeah. um, their, their ability to publish, like, false information and those sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. Well, if you've been watching um, 
the government's attempt to introduce the Miss and Dis Bill, um, which has had to be rewritten because of the outcry of you know, curbing of freedom of speech in that. It's always going to be a tension between protecting citizens and allowing freedom of speech. So as Kath said, teaching people to be able to understand the content, where it's generated from, why someone might have been wanting to say that, so that they have their own ability to um, interpret and manage that information rather than government needing to hold your hand and, and, and clamp down on stuff all the time. It's a it's a fine balancing act and something mm. that something that um, some of our international colleagues in Scandinavia do very well. So they train their um, children from school age in psychological defence yeah. and teach them how to understand and interpret information so that they are not, um, you know, um, drawn into something that is obviously fake or false or designed to polarise, you know, and it works well throughout society from a very young age. So attempting to do something like that would be a lovely balancing act. Excellent. And as Robert, Robin said, you know, there's always that line that people cross where it's actually doing harm. And I think that's where the, the balance we've got to get right. It's difficult. Um, mm. <laughs> yes, very, very hard to balance that. Um, we do have a, a public question. Um, so given the desire to increase critical thinking, did the report look at schooling and how the education system prepares students to think critically in this partly AI driven age? Mm, great question. Um, the task force certainly looked at the curriculum, but uh, looking at children and their education on this particular matter was not necessarily covered um, in the report. Um, yeah, so we have multiple arms that look after these things. So we've got the Department of Communications and their body, ACMA, and then the eSafety Commissioner, who also play a role in trying to manage harms online and lift, uplift um, understanding and skill sets across the Australian public. Um, I wouldn't doubt that it's something that will be um, included in future iterations of the curriculum as uh, the effects of AI become more prominent. Um, and and are uh, used for information on school aged children. So yep. teaching them the ability to, to res resist or understand better and how to interpret that will certainly become, I would imagine, become part of the curriculum. Kath, I don't know if you've got anything to add there. I'd, I'd just say that um, while we don't directly address that we those issues on curriculum and we don't have the power to either it's outside our remit we have engaged very broadly across government across state governments um, with various groups um, and i think that these conversations are happening they're not um, limited to our report and certainly um, there's, um, we're working directly with the cultural institutions, for instance, and hoping to get some programs up that then will go out to the community more broadly. And in terms of educating, sometimes the education is a child taking their parents to something or vice versa. So it's not directly impacting uh, the curriculum as such or changing the curriculum. And that would be very difficult with each state and territory having their own curriculums apart from the, um, you know, private schools and public schools. So it's that that is a very big ask. And certainly it's um, something that is part of the conversation at the moment. It's just not directly on um, recorded in our report. Excellent. Um I think that concludes all of the questions that we have. Um, did you have anything else to say, Robin and Kathleen? Or anything else you want to call people to? Um, Choose our topic. Yeah, challenge. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to one. hear from you. We'd love to have other eyes on it. I mean, that's the thing, right? You can uh, get very blindsided or very narrow in your vision and maybe be excited to learn what um, can come out of the GovHack. Excellent. So yeah, that concludes our presentation for tonight. For tonight. Uh, just a reminder to everyone to please check out the GovHack website and Hackerspace if you're interested in attending any other digital conference events. Um, and if you haven't already, obviously, I encourage you to register for this year's GovHack competition, which is from the 6th to the 8th of September. Uh, so that concludes us for tonight. Thank you for your time, Robin, Kathleen, and everybody who's, who's attended. Our pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Bye.